Humanity has spent a lot of its time trying to understand its place in the world, and we tell ourselves a lot of stories to understand that. We have a good idea of the physics and the physical geography of the solar system and of the universe now. We kind of know how it's shaped, but we don't know how it's filled. We don't know how busy the universe is. And we also don't completely understand how it is that life came to arise. Finding a second example of life would first of all allow us to understand maybe how different that life is from our own, but it also gives us some idea how common life is. In 2021, Dr. Raymond Francis was part of the team that landed NASA's Perseverance rover on Mars. Its mission was to look for signs of life in a place called Jezero Crater. Some three and a half billion years ago, this crater had once been a lake, with an environment that by all accounts seems to have been very similar to early Earth. We find life on the next door planet, or even ancient life on the next door planet, it has big implications for our conceptualization of the universe and our place within it. If Jezero Crater, which by all accounts seems to have been a very similar environment to early Earth at the same time, if that place turns out to have had life in it, it gives us an indication that maybe almost every place that can have life does. If, on the other hand, Jezero seems like the perfect place for life and we can't find any evidence that it was ever there, maybe life really requires some very special conditions. Or maybe the universe is more empty and maybe life is very sparse. Whether or not life exists outside our planet is a question that has inspired astronomers, scientists and philosophers throughout the ages. And now, thanks to AI, we're getting even closer to finding answers. Hello there. The ankle has landed. The CSIRO team. What can I do for you? The machines in the factory. Producing a computer program. Welcome to Everyday AI. My name is John Whittle. I'm an AI expert from CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. In this final episode, we're leaving Earth to explore space. We'll hear more from Raymond about looking for life on Mars a little later. And we'll also hear about how AI is being used to map galaxies and analyze sound waves deep in the heart of ancient stars. But we're starting here, in Australia, looking up at the night sky. The best part about space for me is that we don't know all the answers, and it's so, so incredible to look up at the night sky and see that things are so, so far away. But when you've been lying down on the ground for a good amount of time just looking at the stars, it almost seems like they're close enough to touch, and the secrets that they hold is so immense. This is Kirsten Banks. She's a Wiradjuri astrophysicist and science communicator living on Gadigal country in Sydney. The really cool part about being a Wiradjuri astrophysicist is that you do have that forward looking into the space to understand more and reveal more knowledge. But there's also that history behind you, right? With that culture that's been existing on this land that we now call Australia for over 65,000 years. And using space and using the universe as a tool to understand what is happening in the world around you, it's a really, really amazing thing to connect that all together and to realize, wow, that's that's kind of where my passion comes from. It stems from the culture deep within. Kirsten is currently in a PhD program, studying the stars of our Milky Way galaxy to try and understand more about its history and formation over the past 13 billion years. But her love of outer space goes back to her childhood. I was always interested in the sky. My science teachers took my entire year group out on an excursion to go see a documentary about the Hubble Space Telescope. 
I remember sitting there watching this huge screen with these amazing photos taken by this phenomenal telescope flashing up on it and thinking to myself, wow, I needed to study the universe. From that first time of looking up at the sky and studying it, I see the same thing. I see mystery. And I still have that drive to want to learn more and uncover those mysteries. If you look up at the night sky in a city like Sydney where Kirsten works, you'll be able to see about 125 stars with your naked eye. And if you're lucky enough to be in the Australian outback where there's little light pollution, then that number increases to about 2,500. It's a pretty breathtaking view. But it's a mere fraction of the estimated 100 billion stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy. Favourite constellation would have to be the emu in the sky, which in Wiradjuri we call Gugomen. It's an incredible constellation. It's not like any that you would have learnt about in school where there are stars. Instead, it's made up with no stars. It's the dust and gas in the Milky Way galaxy that makes this huge emu shape in our night sky. I can remember being on a camping trip in the deserts of Utah many, many years ago. We were camping outside in the middle of nowhere. It was rainy and the sky was full of clouds. So we actually decided to go and sit in the car and watch a movie. Halfway through the movie, I had to get out to go to the bathroom. Just as I opened the door of the car, I looked up to see that the clouds had parted. And there was this most amazing view of the Milky Way, in a kind of incredible 180-degree view like I'd never before seen in my life. The clouds only parted for those two minutes, and then it was gone. So if I hadn't have gotten out of the car at that exact moment, I might have missed it. But really, no matter where you are in the world and how clearly you can see the galaxy of stars that we're in, it's a pretty awe-inspiring experience to think that we're just a speck of dust in all of this endless space. So what are we actually looking at when we gaze up at the night sky? So hydrogen, helium, gas, stars, so that's baryonic matter. So all that matter plus dark matter is in a gravitationally bound entity known as a galaxy. So when this entity reaches, you know, sufficient density and temperature, stars and baryons form. And out of the byproducts of stars, planets and solar systems form. Dr. Ivy Wong works at CSIRO, investigating the evolution of galaxies. In my opinion, Ivy has one of the coolest jobs in the world. Not only is she an astronomer, which I think every kid wants to be at some point, but she's also applying AI to space research. I am a radio astronomer, so by and large I try to figure out how galaxies get gas to form stars to grow central supermassive black holes. And recently in our work we've started experimenting with machine learning to try to automate ways to classify galaxies. So I didn't, you know, come in from the outset with the intention of working with AI or machine learning to do astronomy. But by sheer force of necessity, this is now my current bread and butter. Cool. So are we automating astronomers? Automating some of the tasks of astronomers will never be able to automate astronomers. Of course not. They're, f- they're far too intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> As astronomers' instruments get more advanced, we end up with bigger and bigger data sets, terabytes of data. An upcoming survey of star forming galaxies called EMU is using super advanced radio telescopes that look deep into space. This survey is expected to detect up to 40 million galaxies across the history of the universe. Many of these will be millions of light years away. Some will show us black holes. We may even detect new objects we've never seen before. They're recording about 75,000 terabytes of raw data per year. But data storage is expensive, so they refine that down to about 5,000 terabytes per year. To put that in relative terms, they're recording about 20,000 CDs of data per day. It's pretty brain-bending stuff. But let's just say this technology will gather a lot of data. 
And with all of this information, astronomers like Ivy will be able to observe galaxies at their different stages of evolution to study how they change as they evolve. So, as I understand it, you are trying to use AI to automatically classify galaxies. Is that correct? And if so, can you tell us a little more, bit more about that? So, in one of the applications that my team and I have worked on is the classification of radio galaxies. Now, you may ask, what is a radio galaxy? A radio galaxy is, is what we call a galaxy that has a central supermassive black hole that's gobbling stuff out around it. We see radio jets associated with this galaxy. And the radio jets come about when the central black holes start gobbling up material around it. And so the accretion of matter stimulates a magnetic fields that pushes the electrons and protons out of a galaxy. And so the idea is to associate all these blobs of emission together and pinpoint them back to the host galaxy. Awesome. So you've, you've basically got a, an amorphous blob of stuff in the sky and you kind of want to draw a line around it and say, this bit belongs to that galaxy and this bit belongs to that galaxy. Is that correct? Yep, because over time they could fade. And so there may be other galaxies that are closer to yay blobs but have nothing to do with the blobs because it's that galaxy there that's burping out these very large jets of plasma. And now I'm able to make the connection to AI because this now sounds to me very much like a computer vision problem in a sense. AI computer vision is at a stage where it can analyze these galaxy and images and sort them into their varying stages. But it's only good enough to sort out 90% of the 40 million. The remaining 4 million galaxies are left to human eyeballs. That's still too big a task. Over a few years, Ivy's team did a call out to everyday people to help them. You could log into one of these projects and review pictures to identify specific galaxies. We started with a citizen science survey and made human beings look at it a number of times first so that we have this data set of what these radio galaxies could look like. This process created one of the best quality data sets possible as it had been reviewed by multiple people. That data set was then used to train the AI so it could analyze the final 4 million galaxies and leave a more manageable number for a team of citizen scientists. If you want to have a go at identifying supermassive black holes or star-forming galaxies, check out our show notes and jump onto the latest citizen science project that Ivy's contributing to. The AI system, called Claren, classifying radio sources automatically with neural networks, uses the same technology that Facebook uses to detect people's faces in your photos. Essentially, learning to recognize certain features and suggest who or what we're looking at. Claren would draw a box and collate together the different blobs into what it thinks is one object. We taught Claren how to identify six different types of classifications of radio galaxies. It's like social media for the universe, building a photo album of galaxies in deep space. Now, all the astrophysics stuff can be hard to grasp in a couple of minutes, so I tried to break it down into a simpler concept with Ivy. Typically in an AI application like this, so if you think of um, you know, uh, movie recommendations for an online streaming service, for example, you might train a system to recommend a certain type of movie for people, but the, their movie choices will change over time. And that's the benefit of the AI, right? You can train it now, but six months from now, 12 months from now, we'll still be able to recommend movies for that person. Now, when we come to galaxies, and this is where I show my lack of understanding of how galaxies work, but I would imagine that the number of galaxies in the sky is fixed. So is it, is it not the case that you can label all of the galaxies once and then you're, you're done? In, in, in other words, why would you need the AI? Or, or am I completely misunderstanding how galaxies work? Oh, no, no, no. You're right. The, the, the number of galaxies and types of galaxies are fixed. 
but our ability to see them actually increases in time. We may not be seeing all the galaxies out there at this point in time, and with more advanced technologies, we see weirder and weirder galaxies. Here's astrophysicist Kirsten Banks again. So galaxies have a lot of gravity as well, and that gravity draws in their neighbours, and then they eventually merge together and turn into bigger galaxies. Our Milky Way galaxy is going to do this in around 4 billion years or so, where it will merge with our stellar neighbour, our galactic neighbour, Andromeda. We will become one big galaxy called Milkdromeda, or Milkometer, I think is the term we're going for. Like Ivy, Kirsten's research also involves studying galaxies to understand their evolution over the past 13 billion years. But Kirsten is looking specifically at two types of stars. Red giant branch stars and red clump stars. These two stars look very similar. So when we look at them with telescopes and just look at their surface features, we see that they're very, very similar. Same sort of temperature, same sort of surface gravity, same sort of iron abundance. Both stars also have helium in their core, but there's one important difference. Red clumps are burning that helium, whereas the gases inside the red giants are inert. They look very much the same. But red clump stars, those ones that are burning helium in their cores, they are what we call standard candles. So we can use these stars to accurately map the galaxy. But the red giant branch stars, they're not standard candles. And since they look very similar, we need to find a way to distinguish these two stars from each other so we can use those red clump standard candles to map our galaxy. Now we can do this with a fun little technique called astroseismology. Of all things, this is the study of sound within a star. Kind of. We can't exactly peer inside a sun or star, but we can detect the energy of sound waves travelling through it. As these waves oscillate, we see the stars twinkling. And these twinkles, or the changes in how the stars emit light, is what Kirsten is looking at, because this gives clues about the star's internal structure. I'm looking very closely into the DNA of these stars. So you split out the light that we collect of these stars across a full rainbow and see features in the dark spots. These observations are very time intensive, with many observations needing to take weeks, months, sometimes even years to get the sort of signal that we need to determine these types of stars. So not very efficient. So I'm trying to find this more efficient way to classify these stars just by looking at their light. And this is where AI comes in. We are using a data-driven algorithm called the Canon. And this algorithm, it learns from the data of these stars, the spectra of these stars, and tries to generate a model based on certain parameters we feed into it to train our models. So temperature could be one of those labels, surface gravity, and some of these astro-seismic labels as well. And then we can test it on the rest of our sample to try and figure out and determine what these astro-seismic parameters are based on learning from the spectra. Like with Ivy and her galaxy mapping, this does an enormous amount of work for the astronomers, so they can more easily tell whether they're looking at the red giant stars or the red clump standard candle stars that can be used to map the galaxy. And it also helps scientists know how old the stars are and how they've travelled throughout the galaxy. So if we know exactly where they are, where they've been, and how old they are, and what they're made of, we can rewind time in a way and figure out what the galaxy was like at the time and place of the birth of these stars, and then give us an idea of what the galaxy was like at those times to kind of fill in the photo album of the history of the galaxy. And through that, understand or try and answer more questions like where did life come from? Why did life begin here around this average star that we call our sun? Why is that the case?
I am a human being just like you. I live here on the earth with everybody else. And, you know, when I look up at the stars, I see the, the, the universe separated from me by only a thin, transparent blanket of air. But I also see a couple of those little bright lights, which are the nearby planets around which or on which we have robots right now being operated from just down the street. And that is very exciting. Looking into deep space is exciting. But we also have a lot to learn by exploring planets much closer to home. Dr. Raymond Francis works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. That's NASA's main facility for robotic exploration of the solar system. Raymond does a mix of research for various robotic missions, mostly Mars rovers these days. One of my early jobs in AI was for NASA. It was about 20 years ago now, the early days of testing out AI with the Mars rovers. Suffice it to say, things have certainly advanced in the 20 years since. So I was pretty excited to talk to Raymond about where things are at now. All right, Raymond. So I'm interested to understand why we need to put intelligence on these Mars rovers. So they're trundling around... Mars, they're trying to do science, but can't they just be controlled by a human operator back on Earth? Uh, one thing that's important to remember is that you know we control these things remotely with radio signals, and even at the speed of light, the planets are far away. And that means that it might be several minutes or hours, if you pick farther out planets, for a signal to get from Earth to that robot. That means that even on Mars, which is one of the closest places we can explore in the solar system, you really can't joystick drive the rover. The further you go, the longer the delay, the more you have to give the spacecraft autonomy and the more productive it will be if it can make decisions on its own. Autonomous navigation is helpful if you want to precisely place a spacecraft relative to asteroids or small moons, or if you want to point instruments correctly from a moving spacecraft. We can give a destination to the rover and say, here are the rules for keeping yourself safe. Here are cameras to perceive your environment go out and get yourself to that destination and keep yourself safe and let us know when you're there. And then also autonomous science, where the the rovers are now able, for example, to select their own targets for their science instruments based on uh, processing images taken by their cameras on board. What kind of science are they doing? I mean, what what are they looking for in particular? Are they looking for little green men up there and bathing around in the the seas on Mars? Or I I presume it's something not quite so uh, sci-fi. You know, little, little green men is part of what everyone imagines. We would love to find evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, On Mars, our efforts are focused on understanding the potential for past life. So we know that there was a Uh, a lake there. And we're now at the point of understanding some of the chemistry of these rocks. So we will soon understand in detail the the environment. Was that lake suitable for for life? We're not yet at the point where we have found fossils or even uh, geochemical evidence that clearly shows uh, the presence of past life. And so a lot of the science focuses on understanding this possibility of past habitability and of perhaps past habitation by probably microbes of some kind, uh, if, if there was anything there. And that means doing geology, because the records are all in the rocks. So there's cameras on board, and you're, you're particularly looking, I guess, for certain kinds of rocks. So I'm presuming that there's some computer vision algorithm on board that is looking at those images and then, um, you know, uh, detecting autonomously that there's a particular rock in a particular place, and then you kick in the the navigation system to go after. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Our most advanced system currently in deployment allows the rover to take images with onboard cameras. Then they process those images with uh, some algorithms that we have on board, algorithms that have to be designed to be very efficient. You know, we don't have a, a big, powerful processor on the rover. We have one that is more optimized for robustness to radiation and the the challenging environment. But the algorithm can run on that computer and it can process the images and identify objects, which on Mars are almost always rocks, and then pick the rock, which is most like what the science team asked for, and then immediately point and focus science instruments on it and make measurements without asking Earth for permission. 
So the rover's identified a rock that it's been told to find. It, it kicks in its autonomous navigation system and it kind of trundles along the Martian surface and it gets to that rock. Once it gets there, does it do some science on board or does it have to pick up the rock and take it back to Earth for analysis? What it typically does right after picking its favorite targets is point uh, onboard instruments that we have at those targets and make measurements. So it can do some science uh, right there in position. So the autonomous agent has selected a rock and now the laser instrument is firing a powerful laser, powerful enough to vaporize part of the surface uh, and then measure with a spectrometer the glowing plasma that it just made to get the elemental composition of the rock. These kinds of things can help us understand how the rocks formed, where they formed, under what conditions, and whether there's evidence for living things or signs of them in this place uh, that are preserved. You talked a lot about finding evidence of past life on Mars. Is it possible that there's current life on Mars, or is that just too far-fetched? Yeah, I think people have speculated about that. The, the surface of Mars is heavily irradiated, just with solar radiation and with the cosmic rays that are flying around. Uh, it's expected that the top, you know, half a meter or two meters uh, or so of the soil surface of Mars has probably been sterilized by ionizing radiations. It would be hard to find anything alive uh, near the surface. But, you know, anywhere you look on Earth, uh, there is life. And if you go down two kilometers into the rocks in various places on Earth in the continental crust, you will find microbes living in the water. So if there was a past biosphere on Mars three billion years ago, perhaps thriving in Jezero Crater, it could be that after that surface biosphere fizzled out, that life might have retreated to the deep subsurface. And if so, there, there could be life hiding in the, in the subsurface now, as yet undetected. We don't yet have direct evidence of this, but it's something that people have speculated. 20 years ago, when I was a young AI researcher at NASA, there was a project in which NASA planned to put 12 experimental technologies on a deep space probe. A computer scientist there convinced NASA to put a 13th experimental technology on the probe. And that was AI. The plan was that this AI would take full autonomous control of the spacecraft for a 24-hour period. Its navigation, its control, the power, everything. It was going to be the first example of AI in space. I was in the control room when they switched on the button for the AI to take over. I can remember a huge sigh of relief when the spacecraft didn't fall out of the sky. I can't help but wonder, with all the work that Raymond does on Mars, does he still have those kinds of moments of awe? Uh, I certainly have had some particularly exciting moments. I remember being in the mission control facility for the Perseverance rover. This was, of course, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. We had reduced staffing in there. Most people were remote. Uh, there were about five of us in a room that could have held 25. And we were just watching bits of telemetry come back, indicating the progress of the landing. And then among the very first images that came back, was from the descent stage, that rocket pack that lowers the rover down. It took an image when the rover was hanging on cables from the descent stage, just about to touch down, and the rocket plumes had just begun impinging on the surface and blowing sand and dust away, and the rover was just a couple of meters above the surface, and you're looking down into this uh, sandstorm that is just forming in response to the rocket blast at the rover, and you see the rover exactly where it should be, perfectly intact. And when that photo came into mission control, people lost control of their emotions. People were just ready to cry. They were jumping up and down. I had uh, one colleague who sort of reached towards me to, like, to give a hug, but it was Corona times and we were standing far apart from each other. So we sort of did the tele-hug. It was this moment that I will not forget for a long time of how excited people, very you know, technocratic engineering people determined and, and working with numbers and working with facts, uh, suddenly realizing how much emotion they had pent up in this little mechanical system. In this podcast series, we've learned how AI is helping us to explore space, 
how it's improving healthcare and helping us to monitor the biodiversity of the planet. We've also seen how AI is revolutionizing sport. And we've even seen that AI is now becoming creative in its own right. But more than any of that, we've learned that AI isn't some futuristic technology. It's here now. And as long as we take care to implement AI responsibly, it should change our lives for the better. I'm John Whittle. Everyday AI is a CSIRO series created by me and Eliza Keck. Alexandra Persley is our supervising producer, and Jess Hamilton is senior producer from AudioCraft. The AudioCraft production team is Jasmine Mee Lee, Cassandra Steeth, and Laura Briley Newton. This episode featured the sounds of outer space as recorded by NASA, including the sound of the Perseverance rover exploring Mars. We'd love to know what you think, so please subscribe to Everyday AI and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts.